Hello everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Spooky Story Tuesdays with me, your host, Amelia Cotter. I'll just wait for a few people to pop in. Hopefully people will be scrolling through and uh, ask themselves what the heck is going on and want to join in on the fun. I hope everybody's uh, quarantine has been going well. We here are now into week four. Uh, hello, Joseph, and thank you for joining. So you may be asking yourself, why am I wearing a dragon costume? Uh, well, I ask you, why are you wearing a people costume? Uh, no, it's just, uh, you know, we're into week four of the quarantine here and it's time to maybe get a little weird with it, right? Start having a little fun. But it gets even better. I have a four foot long python in my lap. This is, <laughs> this is Sunshine, my only Sunshine, our dear one. He's an African ball python and a rescue, adopt, don't shop. Um, so he'll be with me for a little bit, helping me host through this half hour of excitement. So tonight's theme, as you can probably guess, is monsters. And we have some monster stories on deck uh, that range from, um, you know, theoretical monsters to real human monsters. So first we're going to take another stop with more scary stories to tell in the dark, a favorite children's book uh, with a story about um, the drum. Then I'm going to read one of my stories based on the goat man, who's one of my favorite legendary creatures from the anthology Lost in the Witching Hour. And after that, I'm not going to overload you with too many stories this week because last week my eyes were bigger than my mouth. So we're going to have another Bigfoot story, of course, an exciting Bigfoot tale. And then we're going to end with Ghosts of Key West again with the story of a doctor um, that you may have heard about. This story is actually pretty legitimately disturbing and is not going to be kid friendly. So we will save that for last. All right. So everybody say hi to Sunshine for those that have just joined. This is Sunshine, the African ball python. He's a rescue, as are all our snakes. Adopt, don't shop. Goes for our scaly friends as well. And uh, I am indeed uh, wearing a dragon costume because this week's theme is monsters and life is short. So you might as well get a little weird with it as my dragon costume has gotten askew. It's like jazz, jazz dragon costume. There we go. We're just going to deal with it. Alrighty. If my faithful assistant would please come grab the snack and take him away. <laughs> oh, you guys. Oh, bless all of you. And thank you for your, your friendship and for tuning in and hopefully continuing to tune in. All right, let's get started. Ah, the first story that we're going to read tonight is called The Drum. <clears throat> Once there were two sisters. Dolores was seven and Sandra was five. They lived in a small house in the country with their mother and their baby brother, Arthur. Their father was a seaman and was away on a long voyage. One day, Dolores and Sandra were running across a field near their house when they met a gypsy girl playing a drum. Her family was camping in the field for a few days. As the girl played, a little mechanical man and woman came out of the drum and danced. Dolores and Sandra had never seen such a drum, and they begged the girl to give it to them. She looked at them and laughed. I will give it to you, she said, but only if you are really bad. Come back tomorrow and tell me how bad you were, and I will see. As soon as the two sisters got home, they started shouting, which was against the rules in their house. Then they rode all over the walls with their crayons. At supper, they spilled their food. And when it was time for bed, they wouldn't go. They did everything they could to upset their mother. They were really bad. Early the next morning, they hurried off to find the gypsy girl. Some of these stories haven't exactly aged well. We were really bad yesterday, they told her, so please give us the drum. But when they told her what they had done, the gypsy girl laughed. Oh, you must be much worse than that if I am going to give you the drum, she said. 
As soon as Dolores and Sandra got home, they pulled up all the flowers in the garden. They let the pig out, and they chased it away. They tore their clothes. They sloshed in the mud. They were a lot worse than the day before. If you do not stop, their mother said, I will go away and take Arthur with me, and you will get a new mother with glass eyes and a wooden tail. That scared Dolores and Sandra. They loved their mother, and they loved Arthur. They could not imagine being without them, and they began to cry. I don't want to leave you, their mother said, but unless you change your behavior, I will have to leave. We'll be good, the girls promised, yet they did not really believe that their mother would go away. She's just trying to scare us, Dolores said. We'll get that drum tomorrow, said Sandra, then we'll be good again. Early the next morning, they rushed off to find the gypsy girl. When they found her, she was playing the drum again, and the little man and woman were dancing. They told the gypsy girl how bad they had been the day before. That must be bad enough to get the drum, they said. Oh no, said the gypsy girl, you must be much worse than that. But we promised our mother to be good from now on, said the girls. If you really want the drum, said the gypsy girl, you must be much worse. It's only for one more day, Dolores told Sandra. Then we will have the drum. <clears throat> I hope you're right, Sandra said. As soon as they got home, they beat the dog with a stick. They broke the dishes. They tore their clothes to pieces. They spanked their baby brother, Arthur. Their mother began to cry. You are not keeping your promise, she said. We will be good, said Dolores. We promise, said Sandra. I can't wait much longer, said their mother. Please try. Early the next morning, before their mother was awake, Dolores and Sandra ran to see the gypsy girl. They told her all about the bad things they had done the day before. We were horrid, said Sandra. We were worse than we have ever been, said Dolores. Can we have the drum now, please? No, said the gypsy girl. I never meant to give it to you. It was just a game we were playing. I thought you knew that. Dolores and Sandra began to cry. They rushed home as quickly as they could, but their mother and Arthur were gone. They are out shopping, said Dolores. They'll be back soon but they were still not back when lunch came. Dolores and Sandra felt lonely and scared. They wandered through the fields the rest of the day. Maybe they will be home when we get back, said Dolores. When they got home, they saw through the window that the lamps were lit and there was a fire in the fireplace, but they did not see their mother and Arthur. Instead, there was their new mother, her glass eyes glistening, her wooden tail thumping on the floor. And this is the accompanying illustration. All right, so for those of you that have recently joined, I'm wearing a dragon costume, yes. Uh, it's like super funky dragon costume that wants to be askew. We are in week four of quarantine now, so we're getting a little creative, getting maybe a little stir-crazy. One might say that uh, the time is really dragging. Thank you. The next story that we're going to read is from an anthology called Lost in the Witching Hour. This story is by me. This is a rhyming poem that I wrote when I was 13 years old. I obviously dressed it up a little bit uh, before I uh, submitted it for publication as an adult, and it's going to be featured in another upcoming anthology, um, and it is fun. So actually, first I meant to tell you a little bit about The Goat Man from my other book, <laughs> shameless plug, Maryland Ghosts. Uh, the Goat Man legend prevails around the United States and in other countries as well. I'm sure it conjures up images for you uh, of a pan-like creature. I just have a little paragraph in the book about it. Uh, there are numerous stories of run-ins with the legendary goat man around the state of Maryland, a human-like creature with the head of a goat, or the head and body of a goat, or simply a strange Bigfoot-like creature, that stalks the back roads around Prince George's County, attacking people, livestock, and pets with an axe. The legend of the goat man is often tied into our cultural misgivings about scientific advancements. The goat man was allegedly born either from botched animal testing on goats or human experimentation that occurred in the nearby and equally legendary Glendale State Asylum. That's just a tidbit, and if you're interested in the goat man, I can recommend this really cool book by J. Nathan Couch, Goat Man Flesh or Folklore, which covers some really interesting folk tales and personal experiences of run-ins with the goat man and all of his different personalities uh, from around the country. All right, no, I'm a dragon, I'm not Amelia. Okay, 
So my story is called When the Goat Man Comes. Apparently it is so that when darkness climbs the skies, the old goat man of legend comes out from where he lies. I do not know this for a fact, but so I have been told, and so I shall tell you about this children's tale of old. Through word of mouth and hearsay and mere stories I have found, it is believed he's always here. Oh yes, he's still around. Long he's lurked among the hills and in the fields beyond the hay. He was here long before you and I and walks among us today. When the fog descends on our darkened streets and narrow roads, his long shadow can be seen along the cobblestones. Although I am no witness, I am told of his wicked features. A mangy coat and gnarled hooves, he stands upright, the creature. His horns are that of the devil, his snout that of a boar. His smile, pure torture, with fangs nearly to the floor. You may think it nonsense, as I did, as I always did and do. But then again, as they have said, wait till he comes for you. He wanders in the shadows, seeking souls to make him stronger. On the wicked and the weak, he gorges to feed his hunger. He creeps into our homes at night, upon the witching hour. With his mangled claws, he strikes. Bad children, he devours. And when he's through and his thirst for blood is quenched for that one night, he gallops back into the hills and thankfully out of sight. And from atop the mountain Baphomet, his next victim will hear him howl before he descends upon the town. Why, is that the sound of him now? But you understand, my friends, this simply cannot be. I am a good young lady, and he would never come for me. I do not fear and am proud to say I've always been so brave. To me he is but a folk tale told to make us all behave. Yet this foul noise draws near, I can almost hear him breathe. As I look up from my cozy hearth, a silence comes over me. It is dark and quiet here, though the fire sometimes roars. Is that in fact the old goat man knocking at my door? I'm afraid perhaps I've lied to you, my trusted, faithful friends, and for my terrible sin now I expect I shall meet my end. I have never seen a monster, but we fear what we don't know. I swear I did not believe in him until just a moment ago. I stand quietly trembling and set down my book and pen. My shadow dances dizzily as the fire distorts it now and then. All the silent children and the families of this place no longer need to fear and return to their nightly pace. For the old goat man of legend has now chosen me. I can no longer run away. I cannot dare to flee. I must add to the story now what I did not mention before. The beast strikes weakly on this night, not after or before. To think I never believed it. How could it possibly be real? I had laughed and laughed about it. Not an ounce of fear I'd feel. But they say he's twice as evil as the witches of the caves, the vampires of the north, and the spirits from the graves. And now that I may find it's true, I cannot describe with glee that I reckon he is here now to pay his ghastly visit to me. Before it was all a harmless tale to scare the kids to bed, but it is no longer all that funny now that I'm filled with dread. I hear his hooves upon my steps, smell his stench down to my bones. I open up the door and wish now that I was not alone. Here he looms before me, a sight that I can barely stand. I am face to face now with that old goat man. He bears a sickly grin and puffs at his sweet cigar. But he is the finest dressed creature that I have seen by far. He tips his top hat in greeting and bows over one cloven hoof leg. His suit is a fine burgundy and he sports an expensive cane. Why, he looks just like a handsome devil if I had imagined one before and has no boar snout and no fangs that reach down to the floor. I move out of his way as he begins to step inside. For such a terrible creature, he has quite a charming stride. There are two plush chairs by the fire, and both are the color red. He invites me over as he sits in mine, so I decide to stand instead. I offer him, him some coffee, some tea, or any clair, but with his warm and menacing tone, he tells me to sit down in the chair. His voice has a comical throaty snort with a touch of British flair. As soon as I sit, he advises me, oh, tea, but no eclair. I rush into the kitchen and return nervously with a tray. I can neither describe the fierce beat of my heart nor the depth of my dismay. I hand him his cup of tea as he sets down his cigar with care. I watch the glowing tip turn to ash while I sit down in my chair. The blaze of the fire lights his face as he politely sips the tea. For the first time, his blade-like teeth are visible to me. He smiles in contentment and poises himself to speak. This will be a long night. Already I'm tired, shocked, and weak. I've come tonight on my weekly rounds from the mount they call Baphomet, in hopes that I would find you here for an evening we won't forget. Well, I was not expecting you, sir, on this moonlit night. My tone is meek and mild, and my voice is filled with fright. I visit when I'm most unwelcome. It gives me a rush of power. 
I am here to see you now, my dear, but won't stay longer than an hour. He is just so nonchalant while I can barely speak, yet somehow I manage. I can't believe it's already been a week. Neither can I, but darling, how my hunger grows and grows. I long for the taste of humans, which is something I think you know. Yes, but I was not anticipating that this would happen to me. It is hardly fair at all. I'm a good girl, can't you see? Ah, my child, yes, and so many of the innocent do weep, but I'm afraid it cannot be helped. You are mine and mine to keep. With a shrill bark of laughter, he rears back his monstrous head. I wish that I had listened more to all the things they said. Oh, my dearest friends and family, who truly have believed indeed, what a fool I am. How could I ever have been so mean? I hope that when you do it, sir, at least you'll do it quick. I am crestfallen at the thought and think I might be sick. Perhaps if you had not been such a bad little girl when younger, I would not be here right now, my dearest Beatrice Unger. Beatrice who, I blurt? Why, kind sir, that is not my name. And I always was a good little girl. I can say it with no shame. Suddenly he stands and looks down deep into my eyes. Then I have the wrong person, he states. Well, surprise, surprise. Confusion grows within my head and I feel a chill so cold. I rise up too and stare into the face of this beast of old. I must be on my way then, he says. It was nice of us to chat. Thank you truly for the tea and madam... That will be that. I am stricken with relief, nearly falling to the floor, but I gather up my senses and show this goat man to the door. I believe now I shout after him at the very top of my throat, and with a tip of his hat and a wave of his hand, he is gone, that old man goat. That was by yours truly in the Lost in the Witching Hour Anthology. All right. Who's having a good time, huh? Thank you for joining. If you're here, uh, you may have noticed that I dressed up for the occasion. Uh, it is hot. It's hot under this. All right. Let me adjust this one more time. We're going to read a story about Bigfoot, of course, with a theme like monsters. We can't leave out our favorite cryptid, social distancing champion. And this story is called Sleeping with the Enemy from the absolute classic more Bigfoot campfoot stories, campfire stories. Ugh, I can't read any longer. I've had a very long day. Uh, meaning that there is a first edition Bigfoot campfire stories. So do uh, rush out to find a copy of that because these actually are pretty fun. All right, ready spaghetti? This story was the highlight of a long, hard day fishing. It's a tough job, as they say, but someone has to do it. I was guiding a group of five guys, all buddies from the investment business, trying to get away from the stress of high achievement and big money. We were at a camp along the Williams Fork River in northwestern Colorado. It was a beautiful spot. A fellow named Cash told the story, and after hearing it, I decided I need to get over into Colorado's San Juan Mountains a bit more, but not alone. I used to do crazy things when I was younger, at least they seem crazy now, though at the time they seemed normal, just something to do. One of these activities was climbing alone, which of course entailed hiking and camping alone to get to the climb. I thought nothing of loading up my backpack and heading out into some of the most rugged and wild country in the lower 48 for a week or two, and I often didn't even bother to tell anyone where I was going. Maybe I had what they call a death wish, but I think it was more like being in denial. I don't think anything could or would have happened to me, and I acted like I was invincible, but I knew that I wasn't. One beautiful summer day, I decided to head out for a few days of climbing around the Ice Lakes Basin area near Silverton, Colorado, high in the San Juan Mountains. I had my eye on several peaks, including Golden Horn and Vermilion, both over 13,000 feet. I knew I would see few, if any, other climbers, as most people were doing the big wall climbs and the 14ers, those peaks over 14,000 feet. That left this wild country all to me, though I've heard it's become more crowded in the years since this happened in the mid-1990s. Ice Lake's basin is a stiff climb when wearing a backpack, and mine was loaded to the gills. I left my old beater car at the trailhead and took off in mid-afternoon. I'd hiked the trail before and knew I had time to get to the basin before dark, even though it was steep and a bit hard on the knees when one's loaded down like a pack burrow. I tend to bring everything I might need. I'd rather be prepared than travel light, I guess. I always regretted bringing so much stuff, as I seldom used it all, but the rare time I needed something, I was sure to have it. I made it to the basin just as darkness fell, and like I predicted, I hadn't seen another soul. Lower and upper ice lakes are both relatively small, 
but glaciated lakes right at timberline, set in a basin beneath some impressive peaks. I plan to camp the next night at the upper basin, which has an old mining cabin at its edge that has seen better days, though still standing. It was next to Fuller Lake, with Fuller Peak towering above. In the summer, the area is spectacular with wildflowers, including extensive stands of the Colorado State Flower, the beautiful blue and white columbine. I had my little tent up in no time and my stove out with water boiling for a freeze-dried meal of spaghetti. Even freeze-dried stuff tastes good when you're outdoors. After dinner, I just sat and looked at the stars in amazement. It's never, I've never seen stars like what you see in the San Juans. It's a combination of thin atmosphere from the high altitude and clean air, and the sky unfolds layer after layer of stars so thick you feel totally insignificant. It's stunningly beautiful, though humbling. It's always cold at night when you get into the higher altitudes like that, and even though it was late August, I had on my sweater and down coat and was still a bit chilly. I was also tired, so I went to bed soon after sunset, which was in itself worth the hike up there. It was so colorful. Lots of mare's tails that picked up a wide range of pinks and purples and even oranges. I should have taken more notice that they were mare's tails, but I was tired. I was sleeping well, which was as good as I sometimes can't sleep at all at altitudes above 11,000 feet, when suddenly I woke with a start. Crack! Something had just torn apart a big log not far from my tent. Thump! Whatever it was then dropped it, making the ground shake. I had noticed that log earlier, and it was huge, especially considering it was timberline, where trees struggled to make a living. That log was about three feet across, though not very long. Whatever had picked it up had to be a strong animal. My first thought was a bear, as they'll do that, break logs to get at the grubs inside. But it must be a big bear, and there weren't supposed to be anything in this area but black bears, which don't typically get that big. Maybe it was just a remnant grizzly, I thought, as the last known grizzly in the San Juans was killed in the early 1970s. Maybe this one had survived. The longer I lay there, the more scared I got. If that were a grizz, I could easily be dinner, and this tent would provide absolutely no defense. All I had was my pocket knife, so I would be history. I could now hear footsteps, and whatever it was, this thing was very heavy as the ground kind of shook a bit as it walked. Was it coming my way? God, I was scared. I had to do something. Quick. I really didn't even think about this. It was more a reflexive action, but I sat up and felt around in my pack until I found my little aluminum cooking pan and I pulled it out. I then found a spoon and my headlamp, crawled out of the little tent and turned on the light and started yelling and dancing around in circles while banging on the pan with the spoon and wailing. I did this until I was tired, I don't know, maybe five minutes. When I stopped, I was out of breath, but I shined my headlamp all around me and saw nothing. After standing there a while and listening, I crawled back in and went to sleep. Whatever it was, I had obviously outweirded it. I woke the next morning to blue skies and immediately went over to investigate the log. Now I was really creeped out because all around the log were footprints, but they weren't bear prints. They looked like the photos I'd seen of Bigfoot prints. I realized I was hyperventilating. I looked all around me but saw no sign of anything. I had obviously scared it off. Thinking about that later makes me laugh at the thought that such actions would scare a Bigfoot away, but my ignorance was bliss. It had probably enjoyed the show, thinking about how crazy humans are. Actually, I wasn't feeling blissful at all, but scared. I didn't even make coffee or breakfast. I just quickly broke camp and stuffed everything in my pack. Time to get out. I started back down the trail, then stopped. Getting away from the scene made me feel better, and I decided to stop and make breakfast. It was a beautiful, sunny bluebird day. Why run away? The creature wouldn't bother me now. It was long gone and daylight. I relaxed a bit and made some freeze-dried eggs and bacon then coffee. I felt much better. Why was I leaving again? Oh, a Bigfoot? Don't, they don't exist. I turned around and went back up the trail. I'd come to climb and I was nearly there. The hard part was done, getting up to the lower basin. The upper basin wasn't far. I'd go on up, climb up Golden Horn, and then decide whether to leave, as the day was young. I could still get out by dark if I hustled. I left my pack by a landmark rock, made a bidet pack, and proceeded to climb the mountain. It was aptly named, the top being a glaciated horn. I was excited to make the summit, and I sat there a while looking down on Trout Lake on the other side of the drainage. Massive and impressive peaks surrounded me. So many peaks, so little time. I noticed a bit of breeze picking up, then could see a thick band of dark clouds to the west. A storm was coming in. It was then that the previous day's mare's tails clicked, and I realized something big was coming in, not just a small storm. I needed to get out. 
My decision had been made for me. By now it was mid-afternoon. I had dawdled a bit and was running behind schedule. I'd planned to get out by dark, but it was still doable. I just needed to get a move on. You don't want to hurry down a mountain when you're tired and likely to slip. So it still took a while before I got back to my pack. There was no sign of anyone, and the breeze had died down into a stillness that seemed unnatural. I knew it was only a few hours down to my car, mostly an easy downhill hike, so I made myself a PBJ and enjoyed what were to be my last moments in the basin. It was so beautiful I hated to leave. I pulled out my camera and took some photos. All of a sudden, literally from nowhere, a stiff wind hit. It nearly knocked me off my feet, shrieking and carrying red dust from Utah that quickly obscured the basin. Within minutes, I was in the middle of a gale force windstorm with almost zero visibility. I couldn't believe that conditions could change that fast. Apparently that dark cloud was bringing some nasty weather. I quickly managed to get my big pack onto my back and head down the trail with a sense of urgency. The wind was bitter cold, cutting right through me. I could barely stay on my feet and it had gotten noticeably darker. It was soon spitting snow, making everything slick. I felt like an idiot. What kind of outdoorsman would ignore all the obvious signs? The Darwin Award, they would call it. Climber goes alone, tells no one, sees sign of major storm. Ignore signs, oh, and Bigfoot, throw that in for good measure. Now I was in a full-on blizzard, and it had only been 20 minutes ago that I was blissfully eating a PBJ on a rock in the sun. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and I knew how fast these conditions could change, yet here I was, stumbling down a rocky trail. The visibility got worse and worse, and I could no longer even make out the trail. Where the heck was I? I needed to stop and set up my tent and hunker down before I got totally lost, but the winds were so vicious, I wasn't even sure I could get my tent up. And what if it snowed several feet? My tent would be totally buried. Now I could barely make out something dark nearby, and it didn't look like a rock or tree. It was the old cabin. I had somehow managed to stumble up to the old cabin. The door was laying there on the ground, so I just went on in. It was weird, having the winds drop off as soon as I was inside. There was no wind buffeting me around, and I could kind of gather my senses. The cabin was old and decaying and musty, with one corner kind of collapsing, but it had stood there for at least a hundred years, so I guess I could safely spend one night there without worry. It was now almost dark from the storm, so I pulled out my headlamp and proceeded to organize my camp around me before it got totally dark. My down sleeping bag would probably get me through the night, and I'd just have to pray I didn't get snowed in. I spread my pad out and shook out the bag, hoping there weren't any other critters in the cabin that would want to sleep with me. I sat there for a while, then decided to make some dinner. The winds howled on as I slowly ate. After that, there was nothing to do but hunker down. It was only about six or seven in the evening, but it was dark. As soon as I was soon fast asleep, the wind raging outside. I had climbed a big mountain, so I was tired. Plus, the lack of oxygen of that altitude makes you want to sleep. <coughs> it must have been about midnight when I woke. The winds were unbelievable. I went to college in Boulder, and I once was in 70 mile per hour winds there, and these seemed even higher than that. The whole cabin shook, and I wondered if the old structure would make it through. I can't begin to describe the fury of the winds. It was as scary as it could get. I got out of my bag and shined my light out the door. The snow had stopped, which was good. I might be able to get out as soon as daylight came. It looked like there were only about three or four inches on the ground. It was then that I noticed a faint odor like a cross between something dead and a ripe garbage can. It was inside the cabin. I hadn't noticed it before. Had I just missed it from all the craziness of trying to get settled and survive? It was definitely not there before, I decided, as I have a sensitive nose and would have smelled it no matter what. It was puzzling. I crawled back into my bag, wanting to preserve the warmth. I lay there, trying to go back to sleep, but that odor had me puzzled. What was it? Was it just the smell of the old cabin? Maybe in these winds, any smells should be over in Silverton or beyond by now, as the cabin was getting lots of ventilation. Something didn't feel right. I finally drifted off, warm in my bag, still tired. I have no idea how long I slept before I woke again. The odor was even stronger, and a sixth sense told me to lay completely still. There was something in the cabin with me, something alive and smelly. I didn't dare turn on my light or even move. I was terrified. What if it were the creature from last night? I lay there, frozen in fear. I finally heard something over in the corner opposite me, which must have been loud to hear it over the wind. I listened. It was someone snoring. Oh my God, there was someone in here, and they were really big to make that kind of snore. And now I needed to pee, but I didn't dare move, and this only added to my misery. 
I lay there as the wind howled and the night slowly wore on, wondering if I were dreaming. Finally, I gave up, slipped out of my bag, peed in the corner, and then crawled back into bed. After crawling back into my bag, I could see two red eyes shining in the darkness. They had nothing to reflect off of. They were shining with their own energy. I was again terrified. I had an overwhelming urge to sleep, and I tried to fight it, but couldn't. I drifted off. Whatever it was, if it, wasn't, if it wanted to harm me, there wasn't much I could do about it, and it seemed like it was just seeking shelter, like me. I thought about this later, and I really did fight that sleeping feeling. I wanted to stay awake with all my might, because I was afraid of dying in there, but I just couldn't. It was almost like I'd been drugged. I woke at dawn, and the creature was gone. The winds had stopped completely, and a soft snow was falling. I quickly gathered my gear and headed down the hill. The trail was mostly covered with snow, but it wasn't hard to make out the way. Just go down. A few hours later, I found my car. It had about six inches of snow on it, and it was now snowing harder. I cleaned off the windshield, prayed it would start, which it did, cranked the heater, and headed out. I barely made it to the highway, sliding and skidding as the forest service road was not plowed. It was August, for God's sake. I drove into Silverton and got a motel room. No way I was going to try to get over Red Mountain Pass in a snowstorm. I hated driving it when it was dry. I think I slept all day as I don't really remember much except luxuriating in the warmth and security. I did wake several times in terror, thinking I could hear loud snoring. I knew what was making the sound up in that cabin because I saw its footprints in the snow as I headed out, at least 20 inches long and with five toes, what I'd call a Bigfoot. And that's from Rusty Wilson's More Bigfoot Campfire Stories. There's a whole series of these. They're all fun. They're very cool. Um, he claims that these are people's true stories that they've related to him through, like, campfire stories and hunting trips and things like that. Um, I don't know. You decide. All right. We have one final story to go, and I'm still over time. I can't keep it to a half hour, friends. Um, I need to learn how to speed read. Um, and this one is, again, from the Ghosts of Key West book. This one is not really a lighthearted tale. This is a little bit more disturbing, so you can opt out if you're not into this. But this is going to be about a human monster. Um, and this is a pretty famous case. You may have heard about it or seen a show about it. Um, and the story uh, about Elena Hoyos, and this is her picture. The story is called For Better or Worse. And the little tagline is, When the time came, Carl knew what he must do. By the light of the moon, he slipped into the graveyard and removed her body from its tomb. Transporting her in his wingless airplane, von Kosel took the body home and began the process. And this is Count Carl von Kosel, who wasted his cool name on being a total weirdo. Um, and this story is also entirely true, which makes it even more disturbing. All right, ready? Elena Hoyos was as beautiful as they came. Raised in a well-to-do Cuban family that had fallen on hard times in Key West, Elena had raven black ringlets of hair and was described as full of life by all who knew her. Charming and graceful, she seemed to have it all, including a handsome young husband named Luis Mesa. The newlyweds had a promising future together and were preparing for their first child when things took a turn for the worse. Young Elena had a miscarriage, and shortly after, she became ill and was diagnosed with tuberculosis, a contagious and incurable disease at the time. Her husband left her, and due to her parents' misfortune, they would be unable to provide Elena with the care she needed. Enter the picture, Count Karl von Kosel. Count von Kosel was a self-proclaimed count, as well as many other things. A German citizen, his real name was Karl Tanzler, and though he was well-read in many subjects, it is doubtful that he had any real schooling in the various fields that he practiced. One of these fields was medicine, and it was his work with x-rays that got him a job at the Marine Hospital and led to his first chance encounter with Elena. In his memoirs, the Count often talked of his search for a bride. Though he already had a wife and two children in Zephyr Hills, Florida, he realized he had only settled, so he left them to search for his soulmate. He, knew, he said he knew when he would find her for she had visited him before. When Elena walked into the Marine Hospital, Count von Kosel's thoughts flashed back to Germany 30 years prior. Though it would still be 10 years before her birth, an apparition of Elena appeared to Karl with the ghost of the Countess Anna, who was one of von Kosel's ancestors. The Countess told him of his destiny, and as the veil was lifted on the mysterious apparition, he saw the face of Elena, his bride-to-be. 
Realizing he had finally met his future bride, the Count was quite nervous in taking her blood sample. He was even more excited, and it is said that he fell in love with Elena when he x-rayed her chest. The excitement soon turned to sorrow. The diagnosis was bad. The tuberculosis had advanced and death was certain, but von Kosel would not give up hope on his newfound love quite so easily. He visited her every day and provided radiation treatments free of charge. Free of charge. He showered her with gifts and expressed his desire to marry her, but Elena always declined, saying she was ill and perhaps they would marry when she recovered. She never did. Elena died just days before Halloween and was buried in a simple tomb. The Count could not bear to see her precious body rot in the ground, so with her father's permission, he had the body exhumed and properly embalmed, then placed in a special coffin and crypt, equipped complete with a telephone so he could speak to his deceased love. He visited her every day, and believing he could communicate with her spirit, the two devised a plan to reunite Elena's body and soul. When the time came, Carl knew what he must do. By the light of the moon, he slipped into the graveyard and removed her body from its tomb. Transporting her in his wingless airplane, what is that? von Kosel took the body home and began the process. According to his memoirs, Elena's spirit now began to speak to him, providing instructors instructions on the recreation of her body. The funeral home had really botched the job of embalming. When Carl opened her inner coffin, he found Elena's body in an advanced state of decomposition, and most of her skin was torn off as it had stuck to the now fallen lining. The process of rebuilding Elena's body was difficult, but the Count was able to reconstruct her face magnificently with mortician's wax and plaster. Her head was completed with two glass eyeballs and locks of her own hair. People who later saw her said the face was an incredible likeness. The body, however, presented a problem. When her corpse was removed from the coffin, it weighed a mere 40 pounds. Von Kosel had to bring the weight to at least 100 pounds, and he did so by stuffing her body with rags and saturating her in a custom-made tank filled with embalming fluids and antiseptics. Elena's decaying skin was replaced with silk, as this was the only material as smooth to the touch as her own skin had been. This was very important to the Count, as he, we would discover later. For seven years, Elena shared a bed with the Count in a small out-of-the-way shack on Flagler Avenue. Rumors began to circulate around town about the strange happenings in the Count's house, and eventually reached Elena's sister, Nana. Nana went to investigate, and upon peering through the Count's window, she stood in disbelief. Count Karl von Kosel sat in the small room playing a melody on the organ. In the bed next to him was a fully reconstructed Elena, wearing a wedding dress with a ring on her finger. Her sister had been dead for nine years. Police arrested von Kosel for wanton and willful destruction of a tomb. Elena's body was placed on display in the local funeral chapel where over 6,800 people came to see the body. Key West became a media circus and the story spread around the world. The case never went to trial. A heartbroken Count von Kosel returned to Zephyr Hills living just miles from his first wife. He spent his remaining days writing his memoirs. Hours after the Count had fled Key West, a mysterious explosion blew up the crypt he had crafted for Elena which now stood vacant. Because of all of the media hype, as well as the Count's obsession, Elena's body was cut into small pieces and placed in an 18-inch long box. She was buried at midnight in a secret location. Some people say she is in the cemetery, others under the oldest house, but no one will ever be sure. All three men involved in her burial have since taken that secret to their graves. Count von Kosel eventually died as well. After his death, doctors who had examined Elena's body released some disturbing news. Count von Kosel had consummated his marriage to Elena. As an appropriate ending to the story of a love that would not die, when Carl's body was found, he was lying on top of an open coffin, holding in his arms a replica of Elena de Hoyos. The search for Elena's ghost continues, and though stories arise from time to time claiming to know where her presence is, none have been verified. Nonetheless, the spirit of Elena will always live on in Key West. And here's a photo of uh, her body on display at the funeral home. And this, unfortunately, is a true story. Um, some of the details in this particular story might be embellished, but if you um, want to do some digging, you can find out all about it. So that concludes our monsters-themed spooky story sessions for tonight. Uh, next week... I will probably not be wearing a dragon costume, but 
you never know. Uh, next week we're going to do a special edition because today my book, This House, The True Story of a Girl and a Ghost, was released, the 10th anniversary edition. Uh, and by then, uh, by next Tuesday, hopefully I will have some, some copies on hand. If not, we're still going to go ahead with a virtual launch party. So I'm going to read some excerpts from the book. I'll share some other haunted house stories and I'll show you some objects that come from Walter's house. He's the, one of the main characters of the book, um, based on a true story, of course. And, um, also I'll take, you know, any questions we can do like a Q and A and anybody who joins, um, on the, the Facebook Live watch party and makes a comment will be entered to win a signed copy of the book. So do join me next Tuesday, same time, same place, uh, 6 p.m. Central Time for more Spooky Story Tuesdays. And thank you for coming uh, this week as well. So enjoy week four of quarantine. And with that, I bid you adieu. Thank you.